Um, welcome, Susan. Susan Duncan is from um, Secret Spaces. And I think you're going to tell us a little bit more about yourself in a moment anyway. So I invited Susan to come along because she's going to be looking at a slightly different perspective. Um, because Secret Spaces is, uh, Susan has a whole host of amazing venues on her books. And she's been seeing the lockdown from a sort of slightly different perspective with liaising with those venues. So Susan, would you like to just sort of kick off and give us a little bit about yourself and your background and a bit about Secret Spaces? Sure. Um, hi to everybody. Um, thanks for joining. Um, so yes, Secret Spaces was born out of my firm belief that no event should ever happen in a dull venue. There are some amazing venues out there and I really wanted to create a collection that showcased the fantastic independent venues that we have predominantly in and around the areas of outstanding natural beauty across the UK. So not only are my venues amazing in themselves, they're also generally in very beautiful settings. Um, and a part of what I love about what I do, or was loving about what I do, was going to visit these amazing venues, which obviously right now I'm not, not able to, um, which in itself has... Um, caused us to kind of look at how we do business and how we will do business going forward. And we've, I've come up with a, uh, the fact that we will use Zoom more. Um, and so instead of driving to visit and meet people in venues, we will have initial conversations using Zoom and then use virtual tours um, for, for the venue owners to be able to show me what, they've, what they have on, on site. Because one of the things that we do for all our venues is we write the copy so and how we present them on our website is based on my thoughts and feelings when I visited the venue and I didn't want to move away from that so actually we've learned a lot during the last few weeks in terms of how to do business but do it differently in the, in the new era that we find ourselves in. So today really the, the main focus of today isn't it it's thinking about how we can uh, give our guests the confidence that we can get people to start booking again. Yes, absolutely. So again, one of the things that we've worked on um, during the last few weeks is uh, initially we were making phone calls um, out to our venues and engaging with them and understanding at an individual level what their experiences had been. Um, and obviously their focus initially was dealing with, in, the, in a lot of instances, quite upset brides who were needing to reschedule weddings. Um, thankfully, most the experience for most of them has been that people have rescheduled, postponed rather than cancelled, certainly in terms of the wedding market. So far as corporates is concerned, that's tended to be more of a we'll cancel it and we'll rebook when we know that we can. Um, a bit, I spoke, we've been doing video chats as well with some of our venues, which we've used on social media because I think there's been a trend Obviously, people are consuming a lot more on social media and there's been a trend for people wanting to see people, um, the faces behind the business. And so we've been using those video chats um, in order to do that. And one that I recorded last week, I uh, was asking kind of what they were most looking forward to when they were able to reopen their doors. And, and the answer was welcoming guests again. And I think I, that probably would go for everybody within the hospitality business in general, that it's all about the guest and the guest experience. And I think taking that as the focus um, for when we can reopen doors um, will inform how, how we go about that. Mm. So thinking about that, the, on the one hand, we know that the venues are really looking forward to welcoming the guests, but what are the things that they, that you have seen already working that is helping to get to that point where guests are starting to feel comfortable to start either booking or at least making inquiries again? Well, I think the good news is that inquiries are coming in. So that's really positive. Um, obviously, um, looking at dates later in 2020 and into 2021, um, but it, it is happening. There was a period of time where that stopped altogether. Mm -hmm. And now, as um, for the venues, it's really about thinking creatively um, about how they can position themselves and build trust and confidence, um, as well as thinking practically about what they need to put into place in order, again, to build that trust and confidence um, from the guest point of view, because ultimately, what everybody is going to want is to feel safe in whatever environment they're in, whether they 
uh, they're in a restaurant or a bar or that they're in an event venue mm -hmm. and they're not just going to think about safety from their perspective but they're going to think about the safety of the staff that are there as well yeah. and so though we've been having bi-weekly zoom calls with our venues and we put those together so that they could share their, their experiences mm -hmm. share what they're doing in, in order to get ready to, to reopen um, and to bounce ideas off each other mm -hmm. um, and that's proved to be very successful um, I think people appreciate it when they know that they're not the only pe people that are going through a certain circumstance yeah 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 so what is it what have been the things that you have seen well I know that when we spoke we talked about virtual tours yeah um so maybe you'd like to talk maybe start with that and talk about the virtual tours and and how they're working for your venues and the impact that that's having for customers or for the guests sure i think the virtual tours have been used um initially um in order to um compensate for not being able to do show rounds and so people have been actually booking in for a virtual tour being walked around the property by whoever would normally have done the, the show round, being able to ask questions, to dwell on a certain aspect of the venue. So to all intents and purposes, it's a tour, but you're just not inside the property. Mm. And that certainly helped some of them to secure future wedding bookings, um, because obviously a bride wants to feel very comfortable that they've chosen the right venue yeah. for that, that special yeah. day. But I think they have a place as well as, as venues and hospitality looks to open up in general, in the going back to that, people will want to feel safe, is, is to use the virtual tours to be able to show people within the property what has been put in place. Yeah. So are there screens at bars, at tills? Um, what will the new table setups look like? How will I get from the front door to my table? How will I get to the bathroom um, and really actually treating this as though it's a new opening rather than a reopening mm -hmm. and actually walking in a customer's shoes from the moment that they enter the premises to the moment that they leave and looking at the practical steps that can be taken along the way. Yeah. The good news is that it would seem from various webinars that I've been on um, that the government is likely to issue guidelines that people should follow so far as they can rather than it being dictatorial and you have to be able to do these 10 steps it will be about doing everything that you can within your venue or your hospitality business to be as safe as you can without needing to go through a tick box exercise which I think is is positive mm -hmm. um, ultimately that's been driven by the input from the industry associations who actually understand how a venue works, how a restaurant works, how a pub yeah. works, rather than civil servants who maybe don't have that practical understanding. Yeah. Two, two areas of, of the, the service or the facilities that keep cropping up is that of buffets mm. and the other one of toilets. So what have any of your venues been doing in terms of reassuring guests about, about those things? So they, they all know that the food offering is going to need to look different and, and canapes falls under that as well. Um, and so it's about being creative. Um, you know, the buffet will absolutely be a thing of, of the past, um, certainly in the short to medium term. Um, so looking at things like, you know, can you use bento boxes, picnic hampers um, for a wedding would be lovely in the summer. So guests, go and collect mm. something that is just for them. Yeah. Um, so they are looking at inventive ways of, of still being able to have that kind of self-service aspect. Canapes, um, again, I think will absolutely need to be rethought and represented um, because you can't have people walking around with, with trays. And so, um, but I think most chefs are relishing the opportunity to be imaginative and creative about how they present food in the future um and so i think we'll see some some great trends coming out of this yeah good and i think that what's that's been mentioned on a couple of the other sessions is that people in our industry do tend to be creative people it lends itself to creative people so there have been some fantastic ideas coming up and on that note before we, we 
go back to the subject of toilets because it's, it's an important <laughs> aspect but thinking about that creativity what have you seen any of your venues doing that's been a real hit in terms of um changing their offering during the lockdown have you seen any of them actually offering something for locals to be making use of facilities what's been your experience of that so far yeah so um i mean some of them have been really creative with their marketing and have been taking questions from brides to be which they then recorded the answers to and use those on social media which has been great um some of them have looked at whether they open their gardens because they've got beautiful grounds uh, and that's safe for them to do so. Um, others are looking at kind of setting up rooms with social distancing um, set up so that people can actually visualize what that might look like. Now, obviously at the moment, there remains a question mark over um, whether we'll be on two meters or one meter uh, when, when mm. uh, hospitality is able to open again. Obviously everybody is lobbying for it to be one meter because it makes yes. such a significant difference. 70% yeah. of the hospitality business will be able to reopen with a meter, but mm. only 30% yeah. if it's two meters. And, and I think we, you know, we all know on this, on this uh, Zoom call today what we'd like to see happen, but it obviously has to be safe. And I think, you know, that then feeds back into that com trust and confidence from a, a consumer's point of view, from a guest's point of view. If, if that meter is the rule, that's going to be relatively new when hospitality reopens its doors. Mm -hmm. And so I think that trust and confidence is going to be even more important at that mm -hmm. point. Yeah, absolutely. So on that note, then, like, how do you on earth do you manage, if you've got a function and you've got an event and you've only got, like, five cubicles in the ladies <laughs> how uh, what how are people going to manage these things so um some venues are considering hiring in additional facilities so the uh, uh toilets that would have pre previously been out at festivals which mm -hmm. are obviously yeah. not out at festivals right now so um yeah the, people are looking at how can they provide more facilities um otherwise it will be a question of restricting use and in terms of numbers of, of people within a bathroom environment and having strict cleaning protocols and i think that's the other practical thing that everybody is going to need to have in place is not just for their team but actually to publish what are their cleaning protocols and what steps have they taken um, it seems that actually might be a government requirement that you have somewhere on your website what you have put in place in terms of cleaning protocols mm. and social distancing protocols um I, that's quite dry i think there, you know we, we again we can get creative about how we present that you know it doesn't need to be a list it could be infographics it could be little videos so long as it's very clear um what has been done um then i think again it get that trust and confidence from a consumer point of view will will increase mm. and, and that in turn will mean bookings yeah. yeah i've heard of a few venues that are doing like you say doing little videos of their cleaning processes because actually it's all very well to say that you're doing one thing but actually to see it in practice and people can see for themselves without physically being there that actually that they are adopting these practices and doing everything that that they can what yeah. what other things are you finding that, that that your venues are doing to prepare for reopening you said about you know rather than it being like a a reopening it's like a new opening mm -hmm. what other things have, have people been been doing to get themselves ready so some of them uh, and i think a lot of businesses have done this have um taken it as an opportunity to um get work done that they were intending to get done and hadn't hadn't got done um some of them have taken the opportunity to look at whether they can grow their own vegetables and so forth so you know getting back to that local aspect which i think has been really positive um but yeah it's been about um some of them have struggled to be fair because they've had to furlough so many of their teams and, and a lot of them are sing now running on single one person um doing long hours so but yeah it's been about what more can i do thinking about the guest experience and putting that guest experience at the center mm. of everything yeah and and that that's that's come through very strongly with a lot of the interviews that we've done this week about that guest experience and, and also how it's recognizing that that guest experience will be quite different from how it was before and therefore 
to sort of set those guests expectations in terms of what they're going to be able to to get so in terms of communication with, with customers so if you've got say you've, you've you've got a wedding that you know is being postponed but could in theory because of the numbers and even you know even if it was two meters could actually in effect go ahead what sort of communication has there been from two aspects one with existing bookings and how those stand and the other one in terms of potential new business so prospective prospective clients and, and guests yeah i think the key the key thing for everybody has been um regular communication and engagement with with existing bookings particularly um talking them through what social distancing will mean in terms of their numbers because you know, have a venue where they, they can hold around 200 in, in their big banqueting suite, but mm. with social distancing, that drops to 40. Mm. Yeah. So that's a very different number for your wedding. And, and that has in itself informed for some of the brides whether they've chosen to go for a date later this year or actually just push out by a whole year mm. um, and, and, have, and look, look to have their wedding in 2021. Mm. Um, but... I think we found that more communication at the moment is indeed more and it's better. People are wanting to hear from you as, uh, as their, as their customer. Um, and that's, that's what the venues have been doing. Um, in talking to potential new bookers, again, it's setting their expectations around yes, the data is available. This is what it could look like at the moment, but it may have to change. Um, some of them have actually gone as far as setting up rooms and taking photographs so that they can actually show prospective inquirers what, what, the, what the setting could be. Um, I mean, even down to what, what will be on a table when you sit down at a table, I think the answer is going to be nothing to begin with. Mm -hmm. There won't be knives and forks. There won't be glasses. Um, there won't be salt and pepper. There may not even be linen because they're too, you, you can't keep them clean. And so, I mean, even restaurants, I was just reading an article um, the, uh, in the caterer from Richard Corrigan, and he, he, even they are thinking that they won't have linen on tables. Everything will be a single service of crockery, cutlery, glasses to a guest. Mm. Um, and how, what does that look like? How do you do that so it's still a great experience from the guest point of view. I mean, ultimately, hospitality is about the people, isn't it? It's about the welcome. It's about the smiles. It's about, it's about how your team look after the guest. But it's then everything else that go, goes around that. And it's reimagining and rethinking yeah. all of that right now. Yeah, that moment when you walk into a room and it's all beautifully laid up, yes. you know, and that... Yeah, yeah. If we, get, if we lose all of that, it's so dependent on some of, on, on all the other things, isn't it? So it's finding something that's a substitute for that. Yeah, yeah. and so that that is going to require quite a lot of creativity, isn't it? And I'm and I'm guessing just even some of the set pieces, like having your flowers and things. I don't even know how that really, you know, how are things like that going to work. <laughs> yes, I don't think people people have the answers to all of that no. because there is just so much to think about and I guess the first first thoughts are the practical and then you move on to the creative yeah. and there will be answers for sure just what might that be is it that things are suspended from the ceiling so they're not at breathing heights yeah. that there will be ways but yes that that beautiful moment when you walk into a room where there are tables of 10 all fantastically decorated yeah. isn't going to look the same. Rather a shame if you just invested in a load of new crockery and table linen and <laughs> all the rest of it. Yeah. But but then you, know, you can take individual service servings and wrap them beautifully. Yes. So that they, yeah. as you sit down, it's a big reveal of your beautiful new crockery and cutlery. Um, so there is, yeah, there, there are ways. Yeah. There are other ways. It's sure. about, all about being, being creative, isn't it? Yeah. So it's not just what's happening in the kitchen and being creative. It's also what's happening in front of house and yes. being creative about that as well. And I think engaging with the team on ideas, because, 
you know, ev everybody will have ideas and we'll have all have seen things in our lives as we've gone about them previously and thought, oh, that would be really nice to do. And, and now's the time to kind of dredge back through those, those, those thoughts and look at um, countries that are ahead of us in the curve. So um, I have a friend who works for a business here, but also has operations, food and beverage operations in Hong Kong, and they're able to learn a lot from what they've gone through in Hong Kong, but so can we. I mean, it's possible to look for that information online and just to see what's happening mm. in yeah. other areas. And Germany um, allowed trade shows from the 30th of May, and they've got mass gatherings on their timeline for the 31st of August. So again, we as a, as a, as a country and an industry will be able to learn from, from their experience, which I think is great. Yeah. Sadly, at the moment, events whilst on radar uh, there's no roadmap mm. uh, they haven't and I don't think there will be if I'm honest until um, hospitality opens from the 4th of, of uh, July yeah. and again I'm reading that not everybody will be open from the 4th of July some will wait just to see kind of how that works and yeah. mm. yeah. well even talking to some some of you just this afternoon about opening you know we're talking about middle of July maybe end of July for, for some of these just going back to Hong Kong um, has there been anything anything that your friend has shared that they've seen happening in Hong Kong that would be very easily translated into the UK market at a later date um, a lot of it has been focused on on uh, the use of PPE within service and so they are they for their business here are gearing up that all staff will be wearing masks when they serve to table um in the hong kong market as for most of asia um for customers to wear masks is, is not unusual and they very quickly got used to they wear masks when they arrive at the restaurant they take it off they actually have a bag that they put it in and and so they don't obviously wear it whilst they're dining but then they they put it back on again if they move around. So if they get up to go to the bathroom, then they put their mask back on. Yeah. As they leave, they put their mask mm -hmm. back on. Yeah. Um, I think some, some establishments are, are using a kind of one-way system to prevent bottlenecks. So if, if it's possible, one way into the, into the venue and one way out of the venue so that you haven't got crossover at reception desks. Um, and, and looking at, at, at obviously spacing bookings again, so that you don't get too many people arriving at reception at the same time, because that again is just a bottleneck. So, that, 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 apps to order from the table. So you know, um, apps apps to order drinks from the bar, so you've not got as much interaction with wait staff. Mm -hmm. Using modern technology, if it's applicable within a business, and it won't be applicable to everybody, but. Um, you know, bar service is going to is something that will need to be very carefully managed. Um, you can't be ten people deep. No, no absolutely. Um, um, Troy's just asked about PPE for customers, customers or clients. Also, It'd be interested to know what people's thoughts are on that. And um, while we're getting, asking people to think about that, just as a, bit, a little bit of an anecdote, a friend of mine works for the NHS, and she um she doesn't normally have to be on the wards but she was the other day and she said we had to wear masks and just saying what you're saying about you know in hospitality it's the people that make it mm. if you've got a mask you can't you, you can tell whether somebody whether they're smiling just from their eyes but she said it felt really really uncomfortable and in order for her to interact with the patient she said it was it was dreadful particularly as some of them were quite elderly and they couldn't hear and of course a lot of it is based on almost lip reading you know sub, sub, subconsciously you're lip reading aren't you and she said you lose all of that so she said I ended up having to spend probably three times as long with that patient than I might have done otherwise because I had to keep repeating everything because they couldn't get what I was what I was talking about and she's and she's a very sociable person and she just felt it was so alien to be communicating with somebody wearing a mask and um you know so it's the use of visors i don't know is that a, a, a better option um coming back to troy's question would it be okay to say about ppe for customers any who's got any thoughts on that you want to just pop in the chat box if you've got any thoughts on on ppe for for, for customers and how that might work uh, what are your views on that susan um well i think as you've said for, for us as a as a nation wearing a face masks is not something that comes um naturally um 
and unless the government say it's enforceable, then I think it would be difficult to require it of guests. Um, I personally, I wouldn't see it as something that I would want. Um, I can understand wait staff um, wearing wearing masks because they're they're handling plates with food and so forth. And um, but I I don't see I, I don't see restaurants or bars insisting that people guests wear face masks it would be very difficult um, and I think although our perceptions would it make it any safer but actually if the dining experience is an experience and then to have to do it in a way that where you are um, do, uh, don't those um, uh, was a few weeks ago was it was a, a disdainish restaurant that would put up all these little greenhouse equivalent of a greenhouse but yeah. I've got lots of criticism because Actually, you were then containing the problem within that glass. And can you imagine having a greenhouse in the wedding that we just had? It would be unbearable. Yes. It? <laughs> so I think there might. I think we might see a few sort of potentially rather wacky ideas, but whether any of them would ever actually take off is 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 probably a, another matter. Yeah. Um, Oak Inns have have shown pictures, haven't they, where they've put up additional perspex screening between sections of the restaurant um, yeah. and and done it that way, yeah. um, which may may work for some, but it will not work yeah. for everybody. It won't be possible. And of course, perspex is now a very expensive commodity. <laughs> So one of the things that we talked about previously was um, we, we talked earlier about that communication with customers and. Um, of course, we don't know all the answers. None of us know all the answers. So in terms of one of the things that we touched on was that transparency. So tell me a bit more about transparency and the, about the importance of that. Yeah, I mean, one of the messages that we've been um, conveying to the, to, to the venues is, is about being transparent, is, is regularly communicating, both on a one-to-one -one basis, so whether that's picking up the phone and speaking to people who've already booked, or whether it's using social media to, to say what, you're going, what steps you're taking at the moment, what you think it's going to look like in the future, inviting um, feedback mm -hmm. from, from people, get, engage them in that way, because I think ultimately what the consumer will want to know is that you've thought about this. Yeah. You've thought about them, you've thought about your staff, and you've thought about the, the, the overall experience. Um, and as I say, I think right now, more is more when it comes to communication rather than less is more. I think people are, are consuming a lot. They're consuming a lot of news, a lot of social media. And um, they want to know that, particularly if I think of somewhere locally here like Hillside Brewery, local business, well-known um, local managing director, they've done a great job because they're a brewery as well as an event venue. Um, and so they've used this time to really focus on driving local delivery of their beers. They've, inv they've invented new products for within their beers. They've been hosting free quizzes on a Friday night. So using the time to engage with an aspect of their business, which will also help them when, when the doors can open for events again as well. And they're looking at, you know, because they've got grounds, could they maybe do picnic events before they can do indoor events? Because, mm -hmm. you know, as, as the relaxation of rules continues to happen. So it is really assessing everything that you've got and thinking, well, what practically mm -hmm. and legally and safely can I do right now? One thing that we haven't spoken about, and I don't think we've spoken about it all week actually, is that particularly with the types of venues that you've got, is it that issue about deposits and if I book something now for October or November and it isn't safe to go ahead, how does that then stack up? Will I get my deposit back? Who is liable? Because of course we've had all this issue with insurance companies like, you know, in the small print it says it doesn't apply to pandemics. Um, uh, and so what have you seen your venues doing in terms of those deposits and future bookings which are you know could help to fill that gap between july and maybe you know up until christmas if people do want to go ahead and book but they worry like oh i don't want to commit to something they're being incredibly flexible um so they've worked really hard to retain as many bookings as they possibly can and obviously simply move the deposit forward to the, the to the future date but if people are booking now and paying a deposit, then they, they, will, they have talked about refunding deposits if the event can't go ahead because of 
restrictions on mass gatherings. So they're being flexible, but and also realistic, and also um, hope, you know looking at cash flow for right now, um, rather than saying oh well, we're not taking bookings beyond a certain date because we don't know. It is about what can we do and, and giving, again, that customer confidence that if you book with me and it can't happen, I'm going to look after you. Yeah. So, um, and that, that's worked well for them all. Yeah. And, and it's, I think that, you know, also that one, the transparency, but again, it's about that communication as well, isn't it? And letting, letting, letting them know. I know if you probably, oh, sorry. So, so some people have been really generous as well with the venues understanding that they are small businesses this is cash flow this is you can't resell a venue tomorrow today yeah. other than today um so that some some people have been really generous in in kind of their understanding from a customer point of view of what it's like for the venue to yeah. um Conscious of time, because I, know, and I can see a couple of people have just said messages, they've got other meetings. But before we close, um, what questions has anyone got for Susan? And actually, if you've got a question, what I'll do is, um, rather than putting it in the chat box, is just either raise your hand or put something in the chat box and we, we can unmute you or you can unmute yourself with any questions for, for, for Susan. Who's got any questions? Right, Troy, um, let me just unmute you, Troy. Okay, Hello, go, ahead, go ahead, Troy. Hello, Hello. Susan. I was just going to quickly make one question uh, regarding the single service part, um, with regarding the linen, linen and the service and the drinks. When you say by single service, do you mean by like non-reusable? So with all the crockery that we do have, wouldn't be able to be used and we'd have to adjust in a new way to how we go about sending out food to serving drinks to a one a one time use object no um i think cutlery crockery glassware will will be reusable because it obviously it can be washed at high temperature um yeah. but um again just quoting richard corrigan from that article they are looking at disposable napkins um high quality disposable napkins rather than uh, laundry um so uh, but it, it will be that the, the key thing is that the place setting can't be on table when somebody sits down in the way that potentially it would be normally. Um, salt and pepper pots will be delivered to an individual table, taken away and, and wiped and disinfected before they can go out to, a, to another table. So, you know, if I think of the businesses that I would go to, restaurants that I would go to locally, I can see lots of areas where they're going to have to rethink, you know, pubs that bring out baskets with knives and forks and a spoon a big wooden spoon into the garden because so that they can bring your order to table they're not going to be able to do that sort of thing anymore so okay. um yeah but i say i think there's ways of creatively presenting a single place setting to people that that's that's clean um you know for some hotels where breakfasts um, won't be served in, in the breakfast room anymore because it was a breakfast buffet and they'll be serving to room. I know some of them are looking at almost like an airline style breakfast service. So you, you would normally get everything wrapped, wouldn't you, from an airline yeah. perspective? So yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to kind of clarify and kind of reassure myself on what I've kind of taken note on. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Troy. If anybody oh. wants to chat on a one-to-one -one basis, I'm very happy. Um, collaboration was my word of the year. Um, I've done nothing about it until lockdown happened. But during lockdown, I've had lots of conversations with people just, you know, to kind of explore, find out about your business, find out about mine, talk about experiences and, and, use, and be a sounding board. So I'm very happy if, if anybody wants to do that. So, Susan, how will people get in touch with you? I will put my details in the chat box um, and obviously um, um, anybody can get me through Caroline I'd be very happy for you to, to pass on my um, details as well. What I'll do in the roundup for today if I put, I'll pop your details in there as well Susan yeah. that's okay and then anybody that's not been able to make it live or a couple of people that have had to leave then they know how to get in touch with you. Brilliant so Susan at secret-spaces.co.uk and your phone number so I'll, I'll i'll put that in the in the follow-up email tonight as well good anybody else got any questions for susan
Uh, Haro, you've got a question? Let me. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> like being at an auction, isn't it? And you twitch, or uh, you know, it's like oh, you to the man. <laughs> in there. Um, so, um, Jane Fowler. Oh, oh, sorry. Who was that? I have sent a question to both you, Caroline, and Susan. It's the same question in the chat. All right. Um, Oh, when overnight stays will be away will be possible. Oh, right. Okay. Um, well, I think that falls under the current, some hospitality businesses might be able to open up at the earliest from the 4th of July. And I think that's pretty much word for word how the government has positioned this. Mm. Um, so yeah, 4th, 4th of July seems to be the kind of likely date, um, but there's no guarantee on that but that's certainly what hotels and restaurants are working towards at the moment um, along with self-catering um, accommodation um, but there's no it's not an absolute right now okay thank you Great. welcome well can i just say thank you very much susan um been very enlightening and for those of you who want to stay in touch or, or would like any help from Susan, then I will send out the email address as well tonight, uh, later on. Um, in fact, it might not even be tonight because the interview with Mark isn't until six and it takes quite a long time to um, just sort of sum up everything. And so in, I apologize, apologies up front if you don't get the normal email from me tonight, it might be tomorrow morning. I hope that as many of you as possible can join us for Mark this evening. I was on his five day workshop last week and he's got some amazing strategies which are, they take some effort, but they are easy to do. So uh, I hope that some of you will, well, I hope all of you will come and join us for that this evening. And then tomorrow we are talking to uh, Becky, who's not here today, but she has been here every other day and to Craig Webb, who his background is, is restaurants, but again, he'll be looking at some of the free, making best use of Google. And in fact, um, Rod yesterday talked about, you know, getting your rankings up on Google. So a lot of the things that, that that's what really what Craig is going to be focusing on tomorrow. So how to get your, you're not going to compete with Expedia and booking.com on the on the rankings but at least be the one actually underneath it so that you then get the booking rather than booking.com getting your booking <laughs> going through them instead yeah. so thank you very much susan i hope to see you, you this evening and if not see you tomorrow thanks everyone bye thank you bye